thank you guys for joining us on this uh, cold winter day. A great time for uh, breads of any kind, but I especially love quick breads. Um, if any of you have ever made a zucchini bread, a pound cake, anything like that, those are essentially all quick breads. So um, great, easy breads to make. Um, you don't really need, you know, a lot of time, which, you know, normal breads with, with yeast take a lot of time for the yeast to rise and maybe a second rise and so forth. But I think a lot of times, you know, people forget about things like a quick bread. Um, so we're going to do three different kinds today. We're going to do three sweet ones, I mean, two sweet ones and one savory quick bread. We're going to do a cornbread. And um, it's very, very, one of my favorite recipes. I love this, this recipe. If you need something to serve with chili or to serve with, um, you know, anything, or any kind of soup or anything like that, any kind of New Orleans food, cornbread is awesome. And this is a little bit of a sweeter cornbread. So it's, um, you can cut back on the sugar if you want. So it's not so sweet. We're also doing a ginger pear um, quick bread which is really nice with a little streusel topping on top. And then we're also doing, um, the last one is going to be a, um, where is it? Oh, uh, scones. The scones are quick breads. So we're gonna do a very quick um, variation on a scone. Um, so what is a quick bread? A quick bread is anything that is a bread that is made not using yeast, leavened with things such as um, uh, baking powder, baking soda, or self-rising flour. You can use self-rising flour, which has baking uh, soda in it. So that, that, those are typically the three things that you would use as a leavener other than using yeast. So um, baking powder, baking soda, and I can go through that real quick for you guys right now. And if you guys have questions later, you can ask me, but baking soda is actually um, bicarbonate of soda. And it's basically um, something that you want to use with an acid. So typically, if your recipe calls for baking soda, you'll be using something such as yogurt or buttermilk or something a little bit acidic in order to make the baking soda activate and makes it rise, makes your baked good rise in the oven. Baking powder has cream of tartar, has baking, baking soda in it, and it also has a um, drying agent such as starch, typically like a corn starch in it. And that is something that um, typically you're going to find either a single acting or a double acting baking powder. Double acting just means that it, act, it, it activates when you mix it, then you can let it rest. With baking soda, you have to cook, bake whatever that you make with baking soda immediately. You cannot let it rest because as soon as you mix it, you're, you're, um, your quick bread with your baking soda in it, it will start to activate. So you have to bake it fast. If you're using baking powder, that's something that you can actually let sit for a little bit. You don't have to bake it off really fast. The double acting is it, it actually activates as it mixes, then it activates a certain time when it's um, introduced to heat. So that's what the, the difference is between baking soda and baking powder. But those are your leaveners that you would typically use for a quick bread. So I'm gonna do um, our ginger pear quick bread is the one I'm gonna uh, do first. And I'm gonna do, first of all, a little streusel topping for it. So I have in here some brown sugar, I have some pecans. Um, let me get my recipe to make sure I'm telling you guys the right thing. And I have some flour in here. Um, so I have a little bit of butter and a, probably just about a, a little bit, maybe half a tablespoon. And I'm going to throw the melted butter into my, um, my flour mixture. And then I'm just going to stir this with a fork. Uh, you don't have to use, you know, anything fancy. Just a fork is fine. Just what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get the brown sugar melted into the, um, in, with the butter and then get it kind of like almost like a little bit of a dough. So it's kind of, you can actually um, see it kind of come together. Okay. And that's going to be kind of my streusel topping. I could add a little bit of a um, little bit more. Uh, I could add a little bit more flour if I wanted to, and it'll be a little bit more of a chunky um, mixture. But, you know, I think for what we're doing, I think this is, this is really nice. So this is for when we finish our quick bread. And I am going to go ahead, can we move that over this way? And I'm going to go ahead and we're going to start mixing our dough for our, our uh, ginger pear bread. And what I have here is um, I have some all-purpose flour 
and I have some baking soda and baking powder. We're gonna use both. The baking soda, because it is a little stronger, it'll activate it a little bit faster. And then um, I'm gonna throw this, and actually before I do that, I am gonna actually use some fresh ginger in this. Now, typically when I'm using ginger, if I'm using ginger in a baking recipe, I tell people to use dried ginger. But this time, I'm gonna tell you to use fresh, if you have it. If you don't, you can certainly use dried. That doesn't, that doesn't hurt. But when I use ginger, this is fresh ginger. When I use it, I love, you know, first of all, I smell it. It has to have a really nice aromatic smell. Let's move it just a little bit. And then um, I want to make sure that the skin on the ginger is nice and firm, that it's not wrinkly, that it's not soft. It should be really hard. And then what I'm going to do is I'm just going to cut off that kind of little knob on the side. And then we're going to go ahead and going to start peeling my ginger. And I peel it with a knife. Some people take um, a spoon and peel it with a spoon. You can do really whatever you want. So I can take the back of my knife and kind of scrape it like this and peel it. And um, that works really easily. And sometimes if your ginger is super fresh, you don't even really have to peel it because, you know, the, the peel is not that, that tough. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my little microplane grater and I'm just going to go ahead and grate some ginger into my batter, my, into my flour mixture. These are my dry ingredients. All right. So this is just fresh, fresh ginger. If you were going to do the dry ginger, I would do just a little bit less dry ginger than fresh. Okay. And then I think you'd be okay. It's going to give it the same flavor, but the fresh is certainly going to give it more, a lot more flavor. I have some that I already peeled. And we'll just grate that. The microplane grater is an awesome piece of equipment, guys. It works so nice for lots of different things. It's great for zesting uh, citrus. It's great for um, Parmesan cheese, for chocolate, all kinds of things. So it's a great little gadget um, to have on hand. It's one of those things I make sure that I, you know, I always have it with me. So I'm just going to kind of take that ginger and stir it into my flour so that it kind of gets coated and it's not clumped, okay? So at this point, I am gonna take my butter and I have some softened butter and I always use unsalted butter when I'm baking because I can add a little bit of salt if I want to. But if I add too much salt um, in something, you know, if, I add, if I'm using salted butter and then I add a little bit of salt, your baked good could be a little too salty. So you gotta kind of be careful with that. I have some light brown sugar here. We're gonna throw that in my mixer. Brown sugar and, um, and my uh, butter. Softened butter, room temperature. All right, so we're just gonna let that kind of fluff up. So let the butter kind of get a little bit um, mixed in and get fluffy in with the brown sugar. If you have not thought ahead and put your butter out on the kitchen counter, to soften, you can actually take it and put it in a um, in the microwave in the wrapper for maybe about five seconds, and it'll soften enough that you can use it just as if you had softened it overnight. Other than that, you can also take and cut your butter up into pieces, take a glass, uh, like a coffee mug, put some hot scalding water in it, and then empty the water, flip the glass over on top of the butter, and it will soften the butter almost immediately. So really good, easy way to uh, get your butter softened without, you know, without melting it. You know, if you, if you can avoid that, that would be perfect. So I have my um, butter and my sugar really nice and fluffy. And then I'm gonna take, I have here some um, milk and I have, um, my milk and, uh, and egg and vanilla. I'm just using regular milk, egg and vanilla. And I'm gonna just put in, and I'm gonna add my vanilla to my, my uh, butter and my uh, flour, my sugar mixture. I just kind of eyeball it, guys. A little more vanilla is not gonna hurt. So it's always a nice little, you know, you know a little bit more vanilla. <laughs> With the cost of vanilla, you have to be careful, but it's still not a bad thing. So I'm going to go ahead and now add my egg to this. I have one egg, one whole egg. So we're going to add our egg and we're going to mix that. 
And then what I'm going to do now is with my um, milk and my flour mixture, I'm going to add this in three portion in three separate additions. And that's really important. If your recipe tells you to add your um, your your milk, you know your your wet and your dry mix in alternating um, you know sections, you want to go. You want to be able to do that because. The reason being, if you add all your flour at once, then you add your milk, what's gonna happen is you start to activate the gluten in the flour. Gluten is what makes things tough and stretchy. If you ever made pizza dough or things like that, you know, you wanna have that nice and stretchiness, but if you're making something like a cake or a biscuit or a muffin or something like that, you don't wanna activate that gluten too much because it becomes, your cake will become tough. So by adding a little bit of flour first, so I'm going to add my flour first. I'm going to put about a third of it. And we're going to mix that in first. And then I'm going to take about half of my milk. All right, we're going to add half of the milk to that. And then I'm going to take another third of my flour and we're going to throw that in. And I'm very, I'm very particular about doing this because it really makes a big difference in your finished product. So make sure that you do that. And when you mix the flour in, only until you don't see the flour anymore. When I stop seeing big clumps of flour in, I stop mixing, okay? So there goes the rest of my milk. And I'm gonna add, go ahead and um, beat that in. And then the rest of my flour goes in. All right, so now at this point, it's very crucial that you don't overmix. And if a recipe tells you not to overmix, don't overmix. Really, really important. All right, so we'll start that off slow. All right, so that's basically it. Real simple. So I have a, I, I used a Bartlett pear, and um, you can use any nice, you know, ripe pear. Just make sure that it's not, you know, terribly um, you know, hard, underripe. Make sure that you have, it has just a tiny bit of give to it. And then I cut it into really small dice. So I don't know if you guys can see that, but it's real small dice, okay? Peel it, core it, and then cut it into small dice. And then I'm gonna add it straight to my mix here, and then mix that all together. And that's that. Mixing is done, okay? You wanna make sure that you don't overmix. Really, really important. Okay, you can move that back that way. So I have a loaf pan. I'm going to bake this in a loaf pan. And it will, you know, it rises beautifully. I love to use, um, what I like to use is a product called Bake, bake Clean. And it's, it's, you actually you get it at Gordon's. It's a product that is for baking specifically. And what they do is they mix, um, they mix, it's an oil and uh, flour product. So it's a spray and it's mixed with oil and flour. So you have the extra added benefit of having that flour so things don't stick, okay? So I am going to spray this and I never spray my pans until right before I add my batter to it. Because what happens is, and if you've ever done it and you see that, that spray start dripping to the bottom of your pan, you get this pool of oil on the bottom and you know, it just, it, it's, it, it doesn't do the job it's supposed to. And don't soak your pans, just really a quick, nice quick spray. So I have it beautifully sprayed. And then I'm gonna go ahead and put my uh, batter in and kind of very, very, um, I, I always say I was like my mother. I'm always making sure that I use the, every little bit, every little bit counts. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and scrape my bowl. And then I'm gonna just add this in clumps. All right, one, two, and then three clumps. A oh, four, we'll do four. And then basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna spread this on top. All right, real simple. That's one of the reasons, I mean, it's, it takes longer to get your ingredients together than it is, does to actually, um, you know, bake the, the, uh, the, 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 um, the, the pan of uh, bread. 
So I'm going to just spread this a little bit so that it's, you guys can see it comes about, I don't know if you guys can see, but it comes about halfway up the side of my pan, which is, you know, perfect. So once it bakes, it will actually rise all the way to the top of the pan. So you're going to get a beautiful rise on this. So I'm going to take my little uh, streusel mixture that I made. All right. And then I'm going to spread this right on top. And with my hands, your best tools are your hands. So with my hands, I'm going to take and just kind of spread this. And then I'm just going to kind of press it into um, the, the batter. Sometimes when you make a streusel, and if you don't kind of press, give it a, just a very light press into your batter, you end up um, losing half of it when you take the bread out of the pan. So just give it that little bit of press and then you end up with, you know, saving most of your streusel. Okay, so this is going to go in a uh, 350 degree oven for probably about, I'd say about 55 minutes. And um, when a skewer, and I use, basically what I use are just skewers. So if I was going to use like a skewer just like this, bamboo skewers, and to, to test, I take it and I go at an angle into the quick bread so that I make sure that I get the entire center of the bread. Sometimes you'll find pockets that are not, that are undercooked. You want to make sure the whole thing is, is done before you take it out or else you, when you cut it, you're going to get a nice little raw um, batter and that's not always pleasant. So make sure you put it in, pull it out. When you, if you see little bits of wet batter, even if the skewer is a little bit wet, I always put it back in for five minutes. And what I do when I use, um, when I put my breads in the oven is if the recipe says 55 minutes, I always put them in at, for like, I set my timer for 35 minutes to begin with. After 35 minutes, I check it. If it's still not done, I'll give it another 10 minutes. Then if I look at it and it's looking like it's almost done, I'll give it another five minutes and then five minutes after that, go in increments of five minutes. I never look at what a recipe says. Be, you know, I use it as a guideline because, you know, your oven may be completely different than whatever oven they use to test that recipe. So just be very, very careful as far as testing recipes because, or baking things. Because if your oven runs, you know, five or six or seven degrees higher, it's going to take a lot less time and then you're going to overcook all your, all your, your, your food that you're making. So we're going to put this off to the side because obviously we don't have the time to bake it, but um, I'm going to show you the one that I made um, earlier. And this is the ginger pear bread. And I made this earlier. I took it out of the pan, came out beautifully. And you can see that it rose really nicely right over the top. And I'm going to cut this to show you. And it's got that beautiful streusel. And it's got a, what a beautiful bread. I'm going to show you guys this. I wish you guys could taste this. <laughs> I really do. But it's gorgeous. And it's baked all the way through. It has a really nice crumb. And you can see the little pieces of pear. And it's really nice. If you want to substitute, you could substitute, um, you could probably substitute apples in there instead of the pears. That would be delicious as well. So, you know, apple, pear, whatever, you know, if, whatever, if you've got some apples laying around, it's a great little bread to make. So we'll put this off to the side and I'm going to really quickly show you guys how to do the cornbread. Cornbread is, again, really simple, very traditional cornbread recipe. Um, that's the one on the corner there. And so I have my daughter and her fiance helping me tonight. Um, they're kind of being my assistants and uh, helping me with the, you know, with the um, ingredients and so forth. So that's who I'm talking to, guys. <laughs> okay, so I have here my dry ingredients. And one of the nice things, if you're making a quick bread or, you know, to be honest with you, cooking in general, baking, cooking, whatever you're going to be doing, follow the old French adage of um, mise en place. Mise en place is so important in all cooking. So if I'm going to be, you know, making my cornbread, I actually, actually what I like to do is I like to get all my dry ingredients together first, put those in a bowl, and then I have my 
wet ingredients, my egg, whatever else I need, and kind of have that. We're all set to go. So when I'm ready to mix my ingredients together, it's all there. I don't have to go looking for things. I don't have things wet and sitting there and getting clumpy. And, you know, it just works out beautifully. So kind of keep that in mind when you're cooking, when you're baking, anything. Mise en place is terribly important. So my ingredients for my cornbread are um, all-purpose flour. And I have cornmeal, okay, which is, and I just all added it all here. So this is my cornmeal. It is a fine grind cornmeal. If you like a little more texture in your cornbread, you could use a little coarser ground cornmeal. Does not hurt. Works out beautifully. So there's cornmeal in here. There is sugar. And you can cut back on the sugar if you don't want it as sweet, but it's, this isn't a real sickly sweet cornbread. It just has a little bit of sweetness, which is, it just makes it really delicious. Um, and then it has baking powder and it also has corn flour. Corn flour, buy it in the baking section and it comes in a bag and it's, it'll say corn flour on it. And what it will be is uh, basically corn that they baked and dried and then they pulverize it and make it into flour. So this is our corn flour. And if you can see the difference between the corn, this is our corn meal. I don't know if you guys can see it, but this is my corn flour, very much the consistency of all purpose flour. But it really kind of gives the cornbread a little more corny taste without being like overly cr um, crumbly. It kind of gives it, it, it makes the entire um, recipe adhere to each to itself more so you get a nicer um, kind of a crumb with the, with the inside of your bread and it's it's just a little bit silkier but it's also very corny which is what you want with a cornbread so there's that's my ingredient salt always salt salt is really important in sweet baking as well as savory baking because if you don't add salt to bread really doesn't have a lot of flavor even if you've added sugar or other spices so salt is really important. And I use kosher salt, um, you know, typically for everything. It seems to do okay as far as dissolving. So I don't, I never have an issue. Um, I have my, all of my dry ingredients are gonna go into a little bit of a bigger bowl that I can actually stir. And then I'm gonna go ahead and um, in my measuring cup, I have some, well, I had some melted butter, but I'm gonna microwave that for three, seconds and we'll get that back into a liquid state hopefully that's almost there and i'm going to get that just melted butter five tablespoons again unsalted at this point because i've added salt to my cornbread and a little bit longer sorry guys i thought i had that all taken care of <laughs> but the magic of television all right so let's see uh, yeah, that's better. Hey, give me, give me one more, two more seconds, and then we're going to be good. And then I'm going to take a little whisk, and in my measuring cup with my melted butter, which is melted again at this point, we'll just give that a stir. I'm going to add buttermilk, and that's going to be my acidic ingredient, okay, which in the baking, I'm using baking powder, but in the baking powder, it still reacts to an acid. So I am going to add my buttermilk to this and it also buttermilk gives it a nice flakiness so you know that kind of really kind of lends itself to it being a much more tender bread when you're done with it okay so a little bit of buttermilk and if you don't like to buy buttermilk because I know a lot of people don't like to buy it because you get all that buttermilk and then you use it for one recipe and then what do you do with it um, what I do um, sometimes is I'll have on hand it's kind of looks like a, a container of dry milk that if you go to the baking section, it's in a little container and it's uh, dry buttermilk. So basically it's like dry milk powder. You add it to water, reconstitute it, and it becomes buttermilk. Okay, you get the same flavor, you get the same properties that it has, but it's shelf stable. So you just leave it on your shelf and every time you need buttermilk for something, you can, you can reconstitute it and it works beautifully. So I have one egg. Now this recipe, I have made this recipe for big functions, like big um, catering functions and so forth. So this makes an eight by eight inch um, pan. 
Um, but you can absolutely use one of those disposable 11 by 13, I think it is, um, pans that you get at the, at, you know, at the grocery store. If you want to use that, if you want to take it to, you know, a function or something, if you just double the recipe, you double it, it'll fit into an 11 by 13 inch uh, disposable aluminum pan. And then, you know, you've got plenty of cornbread for everybody. So it works really well. Okay. So I'm going to dissolve my egg in here. All right, and I says I see that egg still floating around. Can't so for some reason I can't get it to uh, break. There it goes. Okay, and simply, and this is why I love this recipe because it's so easy. I am just going to pour the the milk mixture into the cornbread, and a little bit of a bigger whisk. I'm going to just whisk that together. All right, so that we have, and I'm gonna show you what the batter is gonna look like. I don't, again, I don't wanna overwork this batter, but I want it to, so you know, now it's kind of a little bit clumpy and it still has a little bit of, um, you know, little balls of un, um, unmixed flour. I'm gonna just stir it until all of that dissolves. And when I see that it's nice and smooth, I kind of like pancake batter. I mean, if you guys make pancakes, it looks just like that, okay? So that's my, that's, I wanna stop there. Again, don't overwork the flour. If you overwork the flour, the cornbread will become denser. It'll become heavier, okay? And you don't want that to happen. So again, I'm gonna take and spray my pan. All right, make sure you do that though. Spray your pan or use some butter, maybe add a little flour to it. Can you take that away, Project? And, you know, you just want to make sure because otherwise you're gonna, it's going to stick. And I love these pans because they're not stick too. So, you know, you have the double insurance policy. So basically that's going to go in my pan. And we're just going to put this again. I think this one goes into a um, 350 oven. And this takes about 50 minutes, 45 to 50 minutes, depending again on your oven. So, you know, always, always check it. You know, I, like I said, 30 minutes, check it, and then keep checking it after that. And that is my cornbread. Basically, it's gonna go right in the oven, just like this, and it bakes up beautifully. So let me show you what it looks like done. I'm gonna put that off to the side. We're gonna have a lot of baked goods around here. I wish I could share them with you guys. And this is what the cornbread looks like. It's beautiful, absolutely beautiful. You know, I mean, I know that a lot of people use a lot of those pre-mixed cornbread um, in the packages, but with this, you're only doing one extra step of maybe buying, you know, corn flour and, you know, mixing it all together, measuring a few more ingredients and you get such a better product, guys. I, I don't know how to, how to describe it. It really comes out beautifully. So I am gonna go ahead and show you what this cornbread looks like. Okay, it comes out beautifully. And I'm gonna cut this open so you guys can see. And this feeds a lot of people. So the beautiful crumb on that, nice and golden. And it is absolutely delicious. It's really soft, it's real tender, and it lasts for a few days. So you can refrigerate it, you can put it in your refrigerator. It'll last for, you know, at least three or four days if you don't eat it first. So it's always, it's really good. So there's my cornbread. And then the last recipe that we're gonna start working on are scones. Because like I said, you can, if you're talking about quick breads, you're talking about, you can just put it right there. Thanks. If you're talking about quick breads, you're talking about things like um, pound cakes. Um, scones are quick breads. Um, let's see what else, um, muffins. Biscuits are quick breads, all of those things, um, you know, any kind of vegetable breads that you would do like a carrot cake or a, um, typically like a zucchini bread or a banana bread is, is, a, is a quick bread. So you have a lot of quick breads that you can, that you can make and they all fall into that category, which is really nice. So we're gonna make our scones and I'm gonna show you how to do that, a little bit of a different technique. All right, so I have, 
in my uh, bowl oh, yes, of stones, I have some baking powder. We're going to use baking powder. We're going to use salt, and we're going to use about a third of a cup of sugar. And for this, instead of mixing it in the mixer, what I'm going to do is I have my butter, which is nice and cold, okay? And we're going to add the butter to the flour and in, in chunks, all right? So I have it nice and cold. It doesn't have to be frozen, but it should be at least refrigerated, all right? So I'm going to take it and I'm going to cover the butter with the dry mixture so that it doesn't all stick to my hands. Now, I could use a pastry blender. Okay, and this is what a pastry blender does. It cuts butter into pastry. So I could use that, all right? So, I, you know, basically just kind of pushing on it so that the, the butter is chopped up and gets mixed in with the flour. I use this once in a while, but to be honest with you, the way that I really love making um, things like this is just to use my hands because it really, really kind of, you know, I can tell when things are kind of coming together and I'm feeling, I can feel that butter and I'm just kind of pressing that butter with my fingers so that it becomes smaller and that, you know, kind of like I'm smooshing it. That's a good word, smooshing it so that it kind of becomes like flat and then work into the flour. And, you know, you're going to say to yourself, oh, I don't know, does this, um, is this going to be, you know, all, all in the, uh, you know, is this all the flour is going to be coated with butter? No, I mean, you're going to have a little bit of flour that's not going to be coated in butter, but what's going to happen is once you get your, your, um, your um, stone mixture all done and you add your liquid to it, it will definitely all come together and the butter will all incorporate beautifully. So what I'm looking for is that the butter becomes almost the size of little peas, okay? You've, you've probably seen recipes say that. Incorporate the butter until it becomes the size of peas. So if you can see this, it looks really small little pieces. And that's what I'm going for here, guys. Just want to get it into nice small pieces. And, you know, it's kind of a stress reliever, too, because you kind of get your hands dirty and it's kind of a nice thing. Okay, so ready to, I'm going to kind of rinse my hands off. And we're going to go ahead and add our, we have some, we have some buttermilk for this. And one egg. I don't know where my egg went. It's right here. And I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to put my egg into the milk, buttermilk, and incorporate it. And a little whisk. These little whisks are little great little gadgets because they can fit in, in uh, measuring cups and so forth. All right, so, so whisk that together. I want to get that egg nice and beaten so that I don't have giant clumps of egg, okay? All right, there's my egg. And basically what I'm gonna do now is just add the egg directly to my flour mix. And then with a spatula or something like that, I'm gonna take my spatula and just mix this together. So what you're gonna see, it's kind of a, right now it's kind of a clumpy, floury kind of mixture. And you will keep on stirring this together. And then when it is almost completely stirred together, and I don't know if you guys can really see what I'm doing here, but I still have raw flour. I mean, flour that's not quite incorporated. But I'm going to take that now at this point, And I have washed. These are washed or blueberries, OK? And this is one pint, so that's two cups. And then I'm going to take my blueberries and just add them. You can add frozen blueberries. And if you're going to use frozen, just don't um, thaw them. Put them in frozen and they work beautifully. All right, so I have my blueberries in here and I'm going to stir them. If I smash a few, big deal. You know, it's not such an issue. So don't worry about it. Now, this is a scone that is called a drop scone. So, you know, Regular scones, if you're going to make, and you can make a regular scone too, but I love these because they come together so fast. My family always complains because I don't make, bake a lot of bread um, because it just takes a lot of time and I'm always baking or cooking something else for people. So this is great though because it just takes me such a quick 
amount of time and it's such a fast thing to do that we end up eating a little bit more uh, breads or pastries, which is a nice thing. So I have my pastry now, which you guys can see is all nice and, and formed together. All right, so this is, a, like I said, a drop scone. I don't have to roll it out. What I'm gonna do is take the cookie sheet and I have a piece of parchment paper on it. Okay, so just line with a piece of parchment. And I'm gonna take the scones and very simply, and this is a nice big cookie scoop. So you're gonna get a nice big scone. You can use a half a size of this if you wanted to, but um, I like them a little bit bigger. I just think that, you know, you're gonna have a scone, have a scone. But if you did them, if you're gonna do them with this size, you're gonna get about six or seven out of this batch. Um, if you do them a little bit smaller, you're gonna end up with about maybe a dozen. So I just drop them just like that on my cookie sheet. And we're gonna give them a little room. You don't need an awful lot of room. They're not gonna really, they're not gonna spread too much, you know, to the side. But you know, a little bit of room doesn't hurt. And I'm gonna go like that. And I'm giving nice, generous um, heaping spoonfuls, guys. These are nice and heaping, okay. So I'm gonna put one here. And then I think I have about one left maybe. I have a little bit of dough left and you guys know me, I'm not gonna let any dough go to waste. So I'm just gonna add a little bit, make them just a little bit bigger, those first two that I did. Okay, so those are gonna put right on top. Okay, so those get put in a 400 degree oven because we want them to be nice and short, which means that they're gonna be nice and flaky. Want them at a little bit of a higher temperature, okay? And it'll they'll bake a little bit uh, quicker, they'll bake a little bit faster, and they'll be a little bit flakier, all right? So this gets put in a 400 degree oven for I'd say at least 20 minutes, again, depending on your oven, always go on, you know, air on the side of caution, okay? So a little bit under before, you know, we don't, don't set it at, you know, 25 minutes and walk away and don't think about it. So I'm gonna show you what the, what the scones look like done. And these are my, my done scones, okay, which are absolutely beautiful. And they're just perfect for breakfast or anything. I've done them for brunches, breakfast, all kinds of things. And we're gonna make a little glaze for them, which is really nice. Just a little orange glaze. You could serve them like this if you're watching your, um, your sugar intake, but you know, a glaze is always a nice thing. So I have two cups of powder sugar and I have freshly squeezed orange juice. And I think that makes a difference. I think if you freshly squeeze all your citrus, oranges, lemons, limes, whatever you're using, I think it makes a big difference in your, in your finished products. All right, so I am gonna go ahead and add my, and I'm only gonna add enough orange juice where this becomes a spreadable glaze. All right, if I add too much, it's, gonna, it's not gonna come together nicely. If I run out of orange juice, I can add a little water. So at this point, I think I have enough orange flavor, but I, I'm trying to get you guys to be able to see kind of, you know, you kind of don't add it all, don't add all your orange juice at once because inevitably you're gonna add too much and it's gonna become way too thin. If it becomes too thin, add a little more powder sugar, okay? And then it'll kind of thicken it a little bit, but then, you know, you're playing that game. So it's always good to err on the side of caution again, add your orange juice a little at a time if you can. All right, so I just whisk that until it is completely dissolved. And then I get this nice, beautiful glaze. You can leave them on your, and I don't, don't glaze your scones until um, they're completely done or until they're, they're completely cool. Because if you put the glaze on and they're hot, the glaze is just gonna melt right off. So what I like to do, either you leave them on the cookie sheet to cool, and then you could take your glaze and just drizzle it right on top. What I like to do to really give them the full effect is to kind of just dip them right in that glaze. And then that comes out beautifully and the whole thing gets nicely glazed. These are, these scones, like all scones, um, scones unfortunately are not a pastry that lasts for a long, long time. 
you know, I say that if you're going to make a scone, you want to eat it at least that day or the next day. So, and these are just like that. Um, you want to keep them covered. Um, you can put them in the fridge if you want to overnight, but that is just an awesome scone, guys. Um, if you wanted to, you could make these with cranberries. You could do dried cranberries or fresh, whatever, however you want to do it. So, you know, whichever way um, you want to do it. And then, you know, I, I, I always make the amount of glaze that the recipe calls for, because if you think you're going to use more, you know, if you, you, you're always going to have some left over. So always use that. You can always make a little bit more. You can always add a little bit more powder sugar and maybe a little bit more orange juice. It's not a big thing. Okay. So that is my pastries. And I want to show you the inside of these scones because they're just beautiful. So if I crack one of these open, get those beautiful blueberries. Oh man, I wish I could feed you guys these. Really, I do. So yeah, so these are absolutely to die for. I, I make, I've been making these for about uh, 15 years and uh, everybody loves them. So, and it's a nice, easy recipe. Other scone recipes, you have to roll it out, cut them um, or use a, a scone mold. And you know, this is just so much easier than doing that. So um, that's about it, guys, as far as what I have putting things together. Does anybody have any questions? So, Mary, there was some questions in chat about the um, cornbread recipe. OK. Um, I, in the printed recipe that you sent me, it says milk, but it should be buttermilk, correct? You know what? I, I made the mistake just now. I thought I was making, I thought I was adding it to the scones and I'm adding, but you can, you can use both, either or. So if you have buttermilk left over from your scones and you want to add it to your cornbread, the mm. original recipe calls for milk, but buttermilk works beautifully. Okay. And I, to be honest with you, the kind of buttermilk that I love, I love like Guernsey Farms buttermilk or Calder Dairy buttermilk because that I mean, that's buttermilk that you can really taste the butter in it. It's delicious. So, I mean, you know, the better products that you use in your baking, you're going to get a better result. You're going to get a more flavorful end result. So, but either or, buttermilk or milk. OK. 